I, I, I'm, this is the first time I've given this talk. You know, usually you have sort of canned talks you gave, and I, I mished and mashed a few things together, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but I recently moved to LSU. I was looking, I was telling Byron, I was looking for a picture of a, a tiger eating a cougar, but I couldn't find one, so <laughs> um, this will have to do. <laughs> uh, I really don't care that much about football, and I don't like the colors either. But <laughs> um, Anyway, so I'm going to talk about uh, polar regions in general to start with. I'm going to get very specific with the dry valleys um, and talk about polar regions, and then I'm going to get a little more broad with climate change. And I, I've, I'll tell you some stories about how I've gotten involved um, uh, talking about climate change and trying to get it out into the public uh, ears and eyes. And that's what the Leopold Fellowship is. That's a group of people. It, it's based at Stanford. And we're sort of trained to talk to the media and talk to the Congress and, and you know, just convey the message. Uh, it's sort of a little growing army. Um, we're losing the battle right now, but we're, we're trying our best. Um, this, this image on the, on the title slide here, by the way, is a time-lapse satellite imagery uh, of Antarctica. And you can see uh, the sea ice, so that, you know, the stuff that doesn't change is the continent, is the, the glacier ice. The stuff that's changing is the annual sea ice coming and going. And if you look closely here, you can see a little iceberg spinning around here. Yeah, it starts there and it moves out further away. So you can see a lot of detail in here. And notice uh, one thing I'm going to bring up in the talk is, is that there's this general um, movement of the sea ice in, in, this, in this direction. And this is associated with the winds that circulate around Antarctica. So just keep this in mind as we go forward. So the specific, you know, this is my bread and butter, and, and uh, anyone that's associated with Byron has seen probably this slide, and, and uh, I'm only going to talk about the, the Dry Valley stuff in, um, at the beginning of the talk, but really uh, how we go to Antarctica year after year and get our work done is through the long-term NSF, Long-Term Ecological Research Network, and there's a number of them around the world, mostly in uh, North America, but there are two in Antarctica. And uh, ours is in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Um, all these sites do different types of things, but we do common experiments and we report back to each other. Uh, there's a number of different investigators in our group. And uh, you can see Byron down here. Uh, we all do different types of things. And it's been really one of the best research experiences of my life. I mean, these people are family. You know, Byron's my brother, right? And uh, we've been together a long time. And, uh, and we've done great work, and we just keep writing great papers and great proposals, and I hope it keeps going on forever and ever. Um, we are, so th these are all the sites. This is temperature versus precipitation. And here we are down here. We're the coldest and driest uh, site in the network. Our closest neighbor is actually, the, these are the, uh, the Alaskan sites. The other Antarctic site's way over here. It's a maritime site, so it's got a lot more precipitation. This is the Rocky Mountain site in Colorado. Um, so you can see we're kind of an outlier. Uh, we're trying to stay away from saying that. We want to belong to the group, but um, we really do lie in temperature pre precipitation. We're at the end. And, uh, you know, up here, this is the Puerto Rican site at the other, at the other end. I think, actually, this is an old one. The, the uh, Tahiti site would probably be up on that top corner now. Um, so we, we do work in, mostly in Taylor Valley, which is down here in the dry valley, as you can see it here. We go to New Zealand. We fly to... Uh, to McMurdo Station, this is a, si a landside image of the region, so McMurdo Station is down here. These darker areas over here across the ocean towards uh, the, this um, Taylor Valley, uh, Wright Valley, Victoria Valley, and you can actually see some of the lakes I'm, I work on. This is Lake Frixel here, and in fact in the next picture I think Lake Frixel is uh, pictured as well, Lake Bonnie here. So they're called dry valleys not because there's no water, there's water there, but there's, they're, they're largely uh, void of glacier ice is why they're dry valleys. So sure, this is the picture of, of Taylor uh, Valley. This was taken by my PhD student a couple of years ago flying into McMurdo Station. And if you're really, really lucky, you get put on an Airbus with windows and you can actually look out. But otherwise, most of the time, and I've never done this, most of the time I'm always in a tin can with no windows, a military plane and you just have no idea where you are. She took this picture, a uh, great one, of uh, here's Lake Frixel again, and uh, Taylor Valley winds back here. This is Taylor Glacier going up to the Polar Plateau. So this is the home base for the LTR, and, and we've been there since uh, 2000, uh, no, sorry, 1993, and uh, we've been doing, um, doing our work, and we have people that, we have a glaciologist looks at the generation of meltwater up here, 
Uh, we have hydrologists that look out how the water flows through the streams. We have people like myself and John Prisky and others who work in the lakes. Uh, people like Byron and Diana Wall work in the soils. And we come up with these common hypotheses and, and answer a lot of questions. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've probably seen something very similar to this, but you know, Byron does a lot of work. And Byron can tell you what, you're what they're doing here. I have no idea. <laughs> but they're doing experiments on the soils. That's what I normally say. Um, changing the light conditions and the nutrients and the, the water levels and so on. Working on the uh, uh, Scott nema uh, and different nematodes in the soils. Uh, there's actually insects up near the coast, these springtails. And there's this endolithic bacteria that lives just in the shallow subsurface of sandstones higher up in the valleys usually. And it's actually harvesting the sunlight that gets through the quartz grains in the sandstone uh, and finding a nice little niche there out of the, out of the uh, wind. And there's also a, a fairly simple ecosystem or, uh, food web in the lakes. Um, there's really nothing big in the lakes. It's all, all microscopic. These lakes have permanent ice covers on top, about five meters thick. Um, there's, not a, there's no fish. There's no crustacean, zoo, crustacean zooplankton. There's no big seals or anything like that. Really impressive. Uh, You've got to get your microscope out to see it. As Byron says, I, I work um, looking at the sediments and looking at the benthos of these lakes. And uh, I work with a benthic ecologist. I'm not a benthic ecologist, but he is. And uh, I do more of the physical side. But this just gives you an impression of what it's like to be on the bottom of one of these lakes. It's pretty luxuriant. You know, this is where the life is. This is, this is where the water is year round. It, you know, there's always liquid water down here. There's enough sunlight getting through that ice where there's, there's uh, uh, light harvesters. There's photosynthesis, photosynthesis going on in these mats. But there's all kinds of things in here. So uh, this is supposed to be a movie. We'll see if it runs. Yeah, so this is just swimming over this mat. And you can see some little anoxic up areas up here, the blackened mats. And the scale here, you know, these mats are probably, the towers on these mats are probably about that big. All right, the water temperature is right around freezing, zero. We use uh, dry suits. Okay, but my big thing really is, is the climate and how the climate impacts these ecosystems, and particularly the lakes. And so we put a lot of instrumentation in the lakes and work on the instrumentation year after year. Uh, and so typically in all the lakes, we have things like uh, light sensor down here for measuring the light coming through the ice. We have pressure transducers for measuring lake level changes. We've got an altimeter, sonar altimeter to measure the ice sickness. It shoots up to the bottom side of the ice. Um, we have cleaning systems for the light sensors, stuff like that. And this past year, we got a, a, a NASA grant to go down and put in these uh, autonomous profilers and samplers to work year round because we're never there in the winter time. It's too difficult to get there in the winter time. Uh, and so we put these in in the summer months and then they work year round. And this is a little uh, profiler that climbs up and down a cable. Uh, it does this twice a day and it measures uh, a number of different things. These are the, the uh, profiler sensors. So we've got CO2 sensors on there. Uh, light, uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. We've got a floor probe that looks at uh, different algal classes, uh, and then an oxygen sensor. And so we get a lot of winter data. We just got our first winter's data back um, this past year uh, for the first time getting overwinter data, which is great. And then we have these phytoplankton plankton samplers, that are essentially just filtration samplers, and it does 24 samples through the winter. And then we've got uh, water samplers as well doing 24 samples through the winter. So again, We've just got, we haven't even got these samples back yet. They're still en route. But these are the first overwinter samples collected from these lakes, so we're pretty excited about that. I'm also running the meteorological network in the dry valleys, and we're, we're slowly going to work more and more towards climate here. Um, but these are autonomous sites that we've got about 16 of them around the dry valleys right now. And uh, this is a pretty old picture, Byron. There's, that's Vanda Station, <laughs> which was demolished like 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, they have wind speed direction, um, temperature, solar radiation, some soil temperatures, you know, soil. Um, and, and we've been collecting this for a long time and getting long-term records out of these stations. Uh, we also work, Diane McKnight's group does a lot of stream gauging, so we have records of stream flow. The streams flow for about six to eight weeks during the summer only. And then this is one of our lakes in the background here. That's uh, West Loba Lake Bonnie. And so now we get into the story phase of the talk. And, you know, so we've been collecting all this data, <coughs> and uh, several years ago, in 2002, we put together a paper and sent it off to Nature on how, how these environments have been changing over time, 
And what we found was, uh, some of you may have heard some of this, may, may have remembered hearing some of this, but we, we found a cooling in our, our, our uh, temperature record over time from uh, by around 86 to the, around 2000. And that cooling was most pronounced in the summer, which is really important for us because we're in the summer, we're right on the knife edge between freezing and melting. And so a warm summer makes a big deal where you got a lot of melt. And that was associated with a decrease in wind speed and an increase in, in solar radiation. Uh, and then there's a number, a number of hydrologic variables that changed. The ice sickness increased, lake levels dropped, uh, stream flow increased. And in the lakes, we had a, because we had a thickening ice cover, uh, we got less photosynthetic active radiation in the lakes, and we got uh, less primary productivity in the lakes. And then there was some impacts in the soils too. We got uh, lower populations of, of um, Scott and Emma and so on. Was it Scott and Emma? Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so this, you know, this, this was kind of big news. It wasn't so much big news that the climate was changing, the climate, the temperature was dropping, um, but it was big news that the ecosystem was responding so rapidly to this climate change. Um, and then we got together with, um, with a group in Illinois that does the, the continental scale. And you know, so what, what's the temperatures doing continentally in Antarctica? And so we mapped out um, where it was cooling and where it was warming over this period from 1966 to 2000. And you can see here, I mean, obviously, this, the uh, reds and oranges are warm and the greens and blues are cold, that more of Antarctica was actually cooling over this period than warming, except the peninsula is a real exception. This is the banana belt of the Antarctic, and it's sticking up towards South America, and it's, it's sort of, its nose is sticking up out of the wind, and it's getting the brunt of this, this circulation pattern going around Antarctica, which I'll talk about a little more. But what we showed was that there is a cooling in Antarctica. And so the title of this paper had cooling in the title, and it came out, and the very next day I made some new friends. <laughs> and um, so uh, I'm not going to read through all of this, but you know, he basically says that you know, well, scientists were saying there's global warming. Well, now they're saying there's global cooling. Well, no, we didn't say there's global cooling. We're saying over this period in Antarctica, it's been cooling. Um, and then he finishes off saying global warming is simply a vehicle that is being driven towards the ultimate destination of the destruction of capitalism. It's that simple. So a little bit of a stretch, but I was, um, I was Russia's, fa Russia's favorite guy that day. Um, also, Ann Coulter picked up this news, and she went and said, according to global warming uh, hysterics, global warming would begin at the poles, melt the ice caps, and then uh, oceans would rise on the basis of such factual series, et cetera. Evidence disproving global warming has been pouring in. God knows how many trees had to be sacrificed to print new data refuting global warming. The journal Nature just published these findings. She talks about it, and then she finishes off. The core of environmentalism is hatred for mankind. They want mass infanticide, zero population growth, reduced standards of living, and vegetarianism. So um, again, we made her day, apparently. And then it got, you know, I let it go for a while, and, and uh, it kept coming in. You know, I watched the blogs, and people were saying, oh, this Dorn et al. paper, saying that there's cooling in Antarctica, and that just throws the whole theory out of whack. And that this, of course, is irresponsible, right? We, we're not throwing the whole theory out of whack. It's a peculiarity uh, that over this period it was cooling, but it doesn't disprove the global warming, Glo keyword being global, right? Um, so we actually made it into Michael Crichton's book. One of our figures is in here, if you, buy, if you ever have the time or the patience to get through this book. Um, <laughs> we made it into Ann Coulter's book, which she just takes those blog postings and, and staples them together and sells them. Um, <laughs> This, by the way, is a great book if you, it's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I read, someone actually sent, sent me this a couple of years after the paper was posted. And uh, it said, according to University of Illinois, when I was at Illinois, the climatologist Peter Dorn, the unexpected colder climate in Antarctica may possibly be signaling a lessening of the current global warming cycle. I never said this. I never said anything even remotely close to this. And someone in Coeur d'Alene Press picked it up and printed it and attributed it to me. And this really kind of annoyed me, and I was like, well, what do I do about this? You know, I, do I write a paper in the Journal of Climate Science? Well, he's never going to read that, right? So I, got, I talked to some press people at University of, um, of Illinois, and they, they suggested that, you know, with this kind of attention, maybe you should write an op-ed somewhere, and he suggested New York Times. And to my delight and surprise, it was successful. So in 2006, I got a, a piece in the New York Times, and... Um, it basically laid out the whole story, and it, I think I did, I can't remember, but I think I named names. Rush Limbaugh was <laughs> in this article. Um, 
and it straightened it out. It said what we actually said and what it actually meant. And I think it made a big difference. Um, you know, I, I kept reading the blogs, and there'd be p people saying, oh, it was cooling in Antarctica. And then someone said, well, no, here, read this. This is the author. This is what it really said, right? Um, and this, actually, the day this ran, you know, you got a, the thing in the New York Times, and you're watching the online bit. And uh, this was, uh, you know, on the online version of the New York Times, there's a little thing at the side, a little sidebar saying the popular article of the day. This was the most popular article of the day, except for an article about uh, bacteria and yoga mats. So, you know, <laughs> almost there. <laughs> All right, so just back to the science for a bit. What's happening now, the rest of the story? Uh, in the dry valleys, we're continuing to uh, not cool, but we're not warming either. It's just, it's, it's sort of, I mean, the, the, black, the black squares here are summer. The uh, open squares are uh, seasonal. So it's the four different seasons all stringing along here. And you can see, you know, it was cooling through here, but we're getting a little warmer now, but it's, it's really not doing a whole lot. Uh, the wind is sort of making a happy face now, and uh, the solar radiation continued to go up to around mid-2000, and then it was leveling off. And we're looking at this maybe being related to sulfate levels uh, in the atmosphere, but that's a paper that's being worked on at the moment. Even with that, though, we're getting lake level increase over time. So uh, this is the lake level record for five different lakes. And you can see we start back in the 70s here. And um, Lake Bonnie, uh, where is Bonnie here, the blue one, has gone up about uh, nine meters since the 70s. So pretty dramatic lake level rise. Uh, lake Bonnie, we know back, way back in 1903, Robert Falcon Scott walked through here. And we know that it's gone up about 16 or 17 meters at least since that time. So it, it's just continuing to rise over the last century or so, even though the climate's sort of not decided on where it's going. Um, and what we know now too, there's been, this is an old paper now, but it's still a good one. Um, what we know now is that that cooling or that, that uh, unresponsive Antarctic climate is, uh, is connected to the ozone hole. So you know about the ozone hole over Antarctica. It's not actually a hole, it's just a layer of thin ozone, an area of the planet where there's a thin layer of ozone. Uh, and ozone, turns out ozone's a greenhouse gas, that it resides in the stratosphere. So when you have less ozone, you have less greenhouse gas, you have less warming in the stratosphere. And you, so you have a cooling in the stratosphere and that cooling is propagated to the ground, okay? And that's what's causing our cooling, or at least, at least that's what's causing Antarctica to not be warming at the rate that we were expecting it to be warming. There's been uh, models, Schind Schindel and Schmidt have uh, made these models showing the, the impact uh, once that ozone hole starts to heal as it's expected to on Antarctica and the impact is we'll start to see Antarctica kicking in at a higher rate of increase as that ozone hole uh, heals. Uh, and looking back at the past with, with more recent data and extending the records back even further, um, there's been some suggestions that even more of West Antarctica has been warming in the past. And so you see we're still in this debate about what's ha been happening in the past, which is a little bit problematic. It suggests we need better measurements. Um, but basically the, the argument now is, or the, the, st the state of the, the science now is that we've got um, you know, pretty much undecided temperature in Antarctica. It's, it's not warming a lot. It's warming in some places in West Antarctica quite a bit. Uh, but the rest of the continent, eh, not so much. Um, this is a great map, by the way, from 2012 uh, Nature paper showing temperature change globally, right? And you can see, I haven't talked about the Arctic yet, but you can see the Arctic is, warm quite a, is warming quite a bit over uh, 1958 to 2009, all these red dots up at the top of the world. Um, in Antarctica, you can see another problem we have in both poles is the sparse data collection. Right? So we're trying to make decisions about how important this huge continent is in, in global temperature changes, and these are the, the records we have, pretty sparse. To show that in perspective, so here's an overlay of, of Antarctica with the United States, and I don't think many people appreciate this. Antarctica's big, very big, uh, and it's bigger than, than the continental United States. And if you look at, this is the glo now the global uh, land stations for climatology, you look at how, how many weather observations we have in the United States versus Antarctica, okay? And Antarctica is bigger, right? So this is a problem that we're trying to, we're trying to make a comparison between temperature records in the in the middle of the world to this. We need to get better observations here. We have exactly two measurement stations. 
that's not right, there should be only two. We have two or three <laughs> me measurement stations in the middle of the continent, which is the size, so that would be equivalent to, if you come back here, that'd be equivalent to having a weather station in Utah here and a weather station, say, in Kentucky. And that's gonna document the entire climate of the United States. It doesn't make much sense. So we need to get better weather records, both in the Antarctic and in the Arctic is pretty sparse as well. Uh, that's showing all the stations in Antarctica. So you can see here are the two. I don't know where that third one came from. But here are the two in the middle of the continent, that South Pole Station. Um, and then there's quite a few in the, um, in the peninsula, and that's because there are quite a few stations there. And this is an easy place to get to. You just fly down to South America, get on a boat, and you can do this year-round. These are much more difficult to get to. Um, so now we're expanding even more. That's sort of the polar regions. Um, and I want to sort of take much of the rest of my time to get on my soapbox about global climate and, um, and we'll relate back to polar regions. But, um, and since the nature of this, this thing you're running here, you, you all should know this by now, but uh, hopefully I can provide some new insights on it. Um, first, just convincing people that it's real. Um, that I heard we we're talking about Ted Cruz. I heard Ted Cruz say yesterday in an interview, he wants to be convinced by the data. And I'm not sure how much more data we can throw at him to convince him. Um, so here, for instance, is average monthly uh, Arctic sea ice extent. Sorry, I haven't even moved globally yet. I jumped, jumped ahead. Um, but this is the, the, uh, the, the Arctic temperature trends. So from 1978 to 2014, uh, you can see a pretty clear decrease in temperature. The sea ice record in the uh, Arctic um, sorry, that's sea ice extent. I really jumped ahead. Um, the sea ice for this, this is the most recent data I could find. So you can see that the sea ice this year, we are really low. Okay, so we are potentially heading into a, uh, we're heading into the summer months with a very thin ice cover so we could see one of our record lows uh, coming up. And contrast that to the Antarctic. And this is the sea ice record for Antarctica. And you can see we got something, Antarctica again is not falling into line. It's got an increasing sea ice cover, okay? So uh, this, this comes up a lot. And th this, when, you, when you read climate skeptics blogs and stuff like that, they'll come back to this one saying, well look at Antarctica. It's actually, for a long time now, the sea ice, rec the sea ice extent has been getting more and more and more. And how do you reconcile that? And the answer is it, it's a bit of a mystery. I mean, a lot of people will say it's a, we don't really know why this is happening. There, there's some theories. Um, one is that I talked about the stratosphere, uh, the stratospheric ozone, and that that has caused a tightening of what's called the Antarctic vortex, and it's called the strength. Uh, it's caused a strengthening of the wind. So there's this vortex, this circular pattern you saw on that title slide, has has uh, caused the the ice to move more. And as you break up the ice and you move it, you expose fresh water that can now be frozen, right? So you've got like a little ice factory going on. You're opening up fresh water, and it's freezing more. That's one possibility. The other is it's now documented from satellite observations that there's more fresh water coming off the continent recently. Right? So if you have more fresh water coming off the continent onto a salty ocean, you can have more freezing because the fresh water is lighter than the salt water. It's going to float on top, and you'll have more opportunity to freeze. Okay? But in response to uh, climate skeptics saying, oh, this disproves global warming, well, it's a mystery. It certainly is a mystery. but. Um, it's pretty clear, we know, what, know mostly what the temperatures are doing, we know there's, there's mass loss from Antarctica right now, but there's more sea ice. Um, we need to figure it out. All right, so now moving to the, the more global picture. Um, CO2 levels over the past uh, 10,000 years. So this is three different records. Uh, one is just down the street from where we do our work in the dry valleys at Taylor Dome. So you know, looking at ice core records, we can, we can say what the level of CO2 is uh, in the past. So this is the, the paleo record for CO2. And then we get, into, um, we get into the Law Dome ice record, which is a little further away from Taylor Dome. And then we get into the recent um, sampling at um, Mauna Loa, Hawaii. And this is the one probably people have seen a lot. And you know, so I'd say based on this, you could argue that CO2 is increasing recently. I think that's pretty reasonable to say. Um, here's the Mauna Loa record uh, up to the most recent values, February uh, 2015. 
And you've all seen this before, I hope you have. Uh, you know, the nice little wiggles. And uh, because I think there's a lot of biologists in the room, you know the wiggles, this is the Northern Hemisphere records, so the wiggles are related to the summer, the summer winter season, the, pho the photosynthesis and respiration cycle. Um, but again, I think you can clearly say from this that uh, CO2 is going up. And in this one here too, also the, there's a plot of the global temperature anomaly. And it shows that uh, temperatures, you know, there's, there's spikes, there's other things involved in how temperature behaves than just CO2. There's many players, uh, but CO2 is one of the big ones. And you can see that temperature is going up with that CO2 increase. The now infamous hockey stick, um, which shows the, uh, the paleo record going back a thousand years uh, of temperature and the clear increase in temperature with the start of the Industrial Revolution. This thing has been picked apart and picked apart and it still stands. There's been numerous investigations of this um, and you know there's been some little errors found but by and large this stands. Th this record is correct. Um, every different way you look at it, this is uh, temperature anomalies um, five different institutes looking at temperature anomalies glo globally from 1980 to, uh, to recent time, and there's pretty good agreement. Completely independent assessments. Ocean heat content from 1955 to 2010. Again, uh, different, different institutes, um, different ways of doing it, but uh, everyone coming up with the same numbers. So the, the, the records seem to indicate that uh, CO2 is going up and, and temperature is going up, okay? Uh, and yet we're still debating it. So this is where it gets a little frustrating, I'm sure, for you as well. Um, how, how can this still be debated, even though we have this evidence that's pointing us right in the face that uh, clearly we're getting increases in CO2 and it's causing an uh, increase in temperature? Um, so now we're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, Byron told me that one of the things he hopes to get out of this is, is give some undergrads ammunition to talk to people like your crazy Uncle Bill at Thanksgiving dinner, right? <laughs> so there's, there's some easy ones. Um, so these are things that, that uh, really you hear all the time and, and for me it's, it's really an easy one to talk about. So for one, it's a conspiracy that all, si all climate scientists are in this conspiracy to fool people in order to get more money for research. Well, show me the money, right? Um, I've got a, a few more responses than just that. One is that, you know, the way, sci well, first of all, scientists are in this business not to work that way. Scientists are in this business to seek the truth, right? It's, it's the way we go about things. We want to get closer and closer to the truth. It's our life, you know? We would not be in this to have this grand scheme to fool people. It just go against the very fabric of our being. Um, the other thing is, how does this conspiracy work? Who's running the conspiracy? How could you possibly have this conspiracy involving perhaps tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people on this planet? It just doesn't seem feasible. It's like trying to fake a landing on the moon. You know, there'd be thousands of people involved with that too. It just doesn't seem like it could work. The one I just thought about while I was putting together this, this talk, why would we even show you that Antarctic data? Why would we show you the sea ice is increasing if we're trying to fool you, right? It doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't it all be warming, thinning ice, melting? No, there's things we don't understand, and, but we're showing you the data, right? Um, so another one, climate change has been going on for all eternity. It's natural. Well, if someone says this to you, ask them, how do you know climate change has been going on for a, a long time? What's the evidence for that? The evidence comes from data. Well, who's collecting those data? Scientists. It's the same scientists that are telling you that in the future, the climate's going to change, right? They're using paleoclimate data to tell you that in the past there's been these oscillations in temperature and CO2, right? And those oscillations in temperature and CO2 are used in the models that predict future climate. So you're using, some, you're using our data to criticize us for the fact that it's a natural phenomenon. You only know it's natural because we told you, right? Um, it's, freezing, snowing, it's freezing or snowing here. How can there be global warming? and then cue the snowball on the Senate floor. Um, all right, well this one, I just saw this yesterday, um, and some of you may have seen this. This is the uh, land and ocean temperature for December 2014, so this is this past winter, right? And you can see where the snowball was thrown on the Senate floor is in here, pretty much the only place on the planet that was colder than normal this winter, right? 
So it's this, this, this concept that where you are, it's the same everywhere, right? It's cold here, so it's going to be cold everywhere. We're clearly, and this was last winter as well. Last winter was brutal in Chicago, where I was at the time, but the rest of the planet was pretty warm, right? So it, the, needing to, you know, get people to wrap their brain around the idea that, that climate's not just weather, for one, you know, it's more of a long-term thing, and a climate's a global thing. Where if we're going to talk about global climate change, you have to think about the globe. And the data shows, and Ted Cruz wants me to show him the data, the data shows that the globe, in a big way, was warm this winter, even though it was cold where he was. He didn't throw the snowball. I can't remember who threw the snowball. It was Jim uh, Imhoff, yeah. Um, all right, so um, this one too, the, C that the CO2 increase is, uh, is not human caused. Um, and you probably heard the one where the volcanoes emit more CO2 than humans do. Okay. Well, this one we, we can solve with science. It's, it's a, actually, I like this one because you can use numbers. It's, it's a budget. We can do a mass balance of the atmosphere, right? So uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with carbon-13, right? Carbon-13 is a natural stable isotope. takes up about 1.1% of all natural carbon on Earth. Uh, plant photosynthesis, they like to use the light carbon, right? So when plants are fixing carbon, they fix the light isotope. What's oil made out of? What are fossil fuel, fuels made out of? It's that, that plant material, right? So, so fossil fuels have a very light isotopic signature with regards to carbon-13. Um, I'm not going to read all of this. If, the the take-home message here is that volcanoes are the opposite. Volcanoes have a very heavy carbon isotope signature, right? They, like, they, they have the heavy isotope. When you get CO2 spewed out from a volcano, it has a very he heavy isotopic signature, okay? So the, which way... Do you think we got increasing CO2? If you want to blame that increasing CO2 on volcanic activity, which way would the isotope plot go? It should go to the heavier isotope, right? Well, guess what? Here's the carbon-13 in CO2. This is from that Law Dome ice core record for the last thousand years, right? Pretty steady, 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 steady. Industrial revolution, boom. We're going down. We're getting much more uh, light isotope in the atmosphere, right? I think this is a pretty good indication that w just the timing, the start of the Industrial Revolution when we started burning fossil fuels, and the, the amplitude and the direction of this curve is pretty convincing to me, that, that this is carbon-13 from the release of fossil fuels that we put into the atmosphere, and we've actually changed the atmospheric signature of carbon, and we can, we can show them that. Another one's carbon-14. All of that, uh, so that, all of that carbon that we're digging up out of the ground and throwing up into the atmosphere is radiocarbon dead. Doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have any carbon-14 anymore, in, in, anymore because it's so old, right? Carbon-14, maybe 60,000 years, and it's, it's undetectable beyond that, okay? So any carbon that's beyond 60,000 years is not going to have carbon-14. So we're dumping a whole bunch of CO2 in the atmosphere that doesn't have carbon-14. And in recent times, since about 1820, We've had a steady decrease, the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've had a steady decrease in, um, in carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So we're, we're diluting the atmosphere with, with dead carbon with regards to carbon-14. Again, it's just a mass balance. You know, we, we make a prediction, we can prove it, right? I think it's, it's pretty easy, should be easy to convince someone that this is human cause, that we're, we're putting this in the atmosphere. Um, all right, another one. So greenhouse gases, the sun warms the planet. How, you know, CO2 is not a big component of the atmosphere. How can it be that important? So here's a plot showing the greenhouse effect, which is, you know, the greenhouse effect wasn't made up for global warming or climate change. It's a real thing that actually keeps us uh, warm on Earth, uh, keeps uh, Venus very warm, keeps Mars marginally warm. Um, but if we didn't have a greenhouse effect on Earth, Earth would be much colder, so you can model that. You can, take the, you can take the CO2, you can take all the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, and this plot shows the, um, so it shows Earth without greenhouse gases. We go from a positive temperature to minus 17 deg degrees Celsius. Venus is minus 43 without the greenhouse gases, and Mars is minus 55. Okay, so that's, that's just purely modeling. We can take the greenhouse gases out. We know there's a greenhouse gas effect, and it drops the, the temperature of the planet. 
All right, another one, this is from the IPCC a couple of times ago, but I've always liked this one. Um, uh, temperature models, right? So we can, as I said, we use past climate variability and past um, earth conditions to, in order to populate the models to make predictions about the future, right? So you can run these models with and without the human influence. You can run the models, um, in this case, this is natural climate drivers only. We're taking, because again, it's just a mass balance. We're, we can take out that CO2 that we're throwing in the atmosphere and we can model what the temperature should look like. And so this is what the temperature should look like without the CO2. And then we model what the temperature should look like in modern conditions, right? And this is the actual data, right? So that we're modeling it both ways and we can actually show that with the human influence, we, we are within that line of the observations. So we can, the model's behaving fairly well and we can test these models by running on past climate that's already gone by. Uh, and this is past climate. And we can show that if we remove the human, in, human impact that the, this warming doesn't occur. All right, and then uh, finally, um, one that I got into a little bit with, Byron mentioned a TED talk. If you want to go online, and there's a TEDx talk that I gave on this topic, which um, was kind of fun. But um, a while ago, I so the, the, the other one here is the, the consensus. Scientists are not in agreement that there's global warming. Um, this started a long time ago when I was teaching a first year class in earth science. And, and um, I had read something, a statistic about how many Americans uh, um, believed that the planet was warming and that we were to, uh, uh, we were to blame for it. And the answer was uh, pretty low. It was down in the, 50, in the 50s, 50, about 56%, I think it was, said that uh, humans were to blame for global warming. Um, or sorry, th that humans believe that the globe was warming, not that there was a cause associated with humans. And so I thought, well, what, did, what would my 101 students answer to this question? So I polled them, I gave them a survey, and um, this is the average of their response was in mid-90s, 95% of my 101 students answered question one, yes. Now you might think, well, yeah, so prof I'm the professor, right? They're kissing my butt and all that. But um, it was totally, there's no reason for them to lie. It was totally anonymous, right? It was just hand it on a blank piece of paper, crumple it up, hand it, hand it back in. Um, so they shouldn't have felt threatened. Um, so the, the students in my earth science class had a pretty strong belief that uh, global warming was real and, and that uh, humans were causing it. And so this gave me the idea, well, maybe I should ask a broader audience. So I sent a survey out uh, with a student, a master's student helped me do this. And we, you know, it's hard to get a database for, for people to give this survey to, but I wanted to poll, ideally poll climate scientists, but then I thought, well, where am I gonna get that data? And then I decided we would poll all earth scientists, right? And so where do you get that database? So I said, well, the American Geophysical Union, but you can't just call them up and say, hey, give me all your emails. You know, they don't like to do that. So uh, we had to build our own database. And what we did is we took this AGI directory, which is a directory of all our sci scientists um, on the planet. And it's a telephone book, you know, it's that big. And we cut the spline off the book, and then we fed the pages through an optical character recognition. We built up our own database. Um, and it, we hired an undergrad. I didn't do that, we hired an undergrad to do that. <laughs> Um, and so we, get, we got a large database and we sent it, it was around 10,000 people. We sent this uh, email questionnaire to, and it was, a, it was one of those online survey things, so they couldn't double dip. You know, they, they got an invitation to participate. They had clicked on that link and they could only answer these questions once. Okay, so it had to be them. They could only answer the questions once. And the response was that, um, here's the general public number again on this bar chart. Um, the worst, you know, when you break it up into the different categories, we asked a few questions. We tried to keep it as simple as possible because I wanted a big representation. I didn't want people to just throw it in the trash. I wanted them to answer it. Um, and we asked them, so, you know, what do you do? What's your expertise? Do you have a PhD? All that kind of stuff. Um, and one of our, our lowest responding groups, well, actually, our two lowest responding groups were that global warming is real, were uh, petroleum geologists, were, were down in the 30s. <laughs> um, and then the other one was meteorologists, which is an interesting one. Meteorologists uh, were only 50% or something like that. And the only response I have for that is, you know, they deal in short-term meteorological phenomena, and they're not long-term climate people. So maybe they think that you can't predict the long-term climate change. But th those, that was an interesting response. But overall, 
the, the, the non-climatologists, non-publishers, uh, were in the mid-70s, sort of. Our strongest group was a small group of people that answered the question who were self-identified as climatologists and uh, were actively publishing on climate change. So they were our experts, right? And out of all our groups, the experts on climate change, 97% believed that climate change was happening and we were causing it. So that got a bit of attention and there was, um, there's some other surveys that came up with similar results. There was a, a publication in the National Academy of Sciences um, that pretty much came up with the same answer. They looked at thir about 1,300 climate researchers in the publication and citation records and their results showed that about 97 to 98 percent of the climate researchers most actively publishing in the field support the tenets of anthropogenic uh, climate change outlined by IPCC. Um, they also did some other stuff looking at the expertise of people commenting on climate change and, and found that the climate deniers were far less educated, I'm sorry, <laughs> they are just far less educated and, and far less actively working and publishing in climate science than the people that support climate change. Um, but they're 97, 98% uh, pretty much agreed with us. And then there's another one just a couple of years ago by Cook et al. Uh, in uh, ERL, and they found among abstracts expressing a position, they, they actually farmed out thousands of abstracts in published journals. Uh, to, they had a team of people working with them to classify these abstracts. Among abstracts expressing a position on anthropogenic uh, global warming, 97.1% endorsed the consensus position that humans are ca causing global warming. Okay, so um, at the same time, just recently, uh, we still have this problem with public perception. Fewer than one in four Americans know that there is a scientific consensus about human caused global warming. One in four, that's really kind of depressing. We're going the other way. Um, and nearly half of uh, Americans believe global warming, uh, if it is happening, is caused mostly by human activities. A de decrease of 7% since the fall of 2012. So that's why I said at the beginning, you know, there's a war on science going on and we're losing the war. The, the public perception is going backwards to where I would hope it would go. Um, so on one side, yes, there's a very strong scientific consensus. It's pretty much undeniable. I don't see how you can debate this. There is a small group of dissenters and some people pick on that. So why is there this small group of dissenters? Well, I'd argue that, you know, that in any kind of change in science, any kind of um, you know, um, oh, so plate tectonics is an example, you know, the idea that plates shift around and there's subduction and plate building at one end and subduction at the other end. You know, that's a fairly recent theory um, and it was only about 10 years ago that the last detractors of that theory died and now 100% buy-in, right? But it actually took a generational shift for those last little pockets of denier about plate, deniers about plate tectonics had to die. <laughs> in order for everyone to believe it. So maybe we're in the same position where we just need to wait a little bit <laughs> and, and we'll get 100% buy-in. Um, so I, I've been struggling with this, you know, because I'm interested in conveying science to public and, and I'm interested, I have kids, I'm worried about their future. Um, you know, well, first of all, why is it important for, for people to understand? Why is it important for the public to understand? And I would argue that's really important because they talk to politicians. Politicians only act based on their constituents. So if we want politicians to do the right thing and not have, never mind, I was going to say not have Ted Cruz as the head of the science committee in the Senate. Um, but if we want politicians to do the right thing, the people have to believe it or else they're not going to do anything, right? So I think public perception is important. So why is there this disconnect between what scientists believe, that 97% that's been shown in every study ever done, uh, and, and the public? And I think one is the popular press. The popular press just has this, this need to offer a balance. So if you put up a guy who says, global warming's happening, you have to put up some other guy that's saying it's not happening, right? That's just the way they work. They like to have balance. Um, and then there's this war on science. And I, I, use, I don't use this term loosely, I, but I think it is a real thing now. There's, there's a war on science, uh, and it's focused on climate science. Um, uh, Ted Cruz yesterday called uh, earth science a soft science, and it's, a, and it's an active um, aggression against earth science, which includes climate science, to try and soften it up to try and weaken it in, in the public perception. Um, there's also, besides politicians uh, who are on that side, there's also um, talk show hosts 
radio, you know, radio hosts, TV hosts, you know who they are, right? They have a lot of books. They read all those books. I showed a couple of pictures earlier on. Um, and so my idea is if we, can we change their minds? If we can change Rush Limbaugh's mind, if we can cha change uh, Sean Hannity's mind about climate change, he's got millions of followers. And he'll say, oh, I was wrong, you know? And then maybe he'll change half of those followers, who knows, but it's gonna raise the percentage. You know, there's key figures we can focus on to change their mind, so how do we do that? How do we change their mind? So I got an idea, I got an idea. <laughs> Bear with me, Bear with me, all right? Um, so, um, so astronaut Frank White uh, coined this, this term, the overview effect. And this is the idea, this is a picture uh, in uh, Earth orbit. And the overview effect is, is, is an effect that most astronauts get when they look back on the Earth's atmosphere, they get this really overwhelming perception of the Earth and how fragile that atmosphere is. You know, you, it's just a little thin thing that, of course we can damage it, right? You know, it's just a little tiny thing. So they get this, this perspective, the overview part is the overview of the Earth, right? This perspective of the Earth. Um, Caught, you know, compare that to standing here on the ground and looking up, and it looks vast. There's no way we can impact this. It's huge, right? How can us driving around our little cars impact this, right? But look back from space, and you get this little tiny, thin atmosphere. Well, yeah, we can impact that. It's a thin veil, right? We, we can definitely impact that. So how do we change the mind of those, of those people that have those followers? How do we do it? Here's my idea. We send them to space, okay? <laughs> All right? And I'm talking about bringing them back too, right? <laughs> so we send them to space, and maybe at least one of them will get that overview effect. It'll be a life-changing experience, and they'll start telling their viewers about, oh, it was crazy, and we saw this little thin veil, and maybe global warming is real, and then it will all get better. So that's my idea. That's all I got for you today. <laughs>